and welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. My name is Cassidy Cash. This week we're taking a look at laundry in the 16th century by asking, did Shakespeare wash his laundry? We have just launched our Experience Shakespeare Digital History Kits, and they let you dive into the history of William Shakespeare and try out a piece of his history for yourself. These kits include a complete history guide along with video tutorials, step-by-step -step instructions, and a full supply list so you can cook, play, and dance your way through the life of William Shakespeare. Find out more and sign up to have a complete kit sent to you every month at castycash.com slash experience. Now, obviously, William Shakespeare did do some kind of cleansing regimen for his clothes, but actually the technical answer to this question is no. William Shakespeare didn't wash his clothes, but that's mostly because men didn't necessarily do the washing. So William Shakespeare would have had clean clothes, but it would have been a woman that he likely hired or his wife or someone working in his household as they gained in status would have been the person who completed this task. Interestingly, as far as laundry goes in the 16th century, it seems that most people didn't wash their outer garments. You'll have to remember that these weren't large mass produced items. This was prior to the industrial revolution, prior to the invention of things like factories. So every single piece of clothing was handmade. It was delicate and it was highly valuable and usually fairly expensive. So the outside layer of their clothes, the things made of high quality materials like velvet and silk were typically not laundered because they were too delicate. They wouldn't hold up to the harsh laundry process that they used in the 16th century. So instead, the outer layers would be taken off when you're finished wearing them and then stored. And you tried very hard to keep them clean, but you just kept them nice looking enough until you'd worn them so much that they wore out and you had to get more clothes. Interestingly, this process of wearing out clothes and deciding that it's too worn, you need to buy a new one, oftentimes when the aristocratic or nobility level families would decide that their clothes were ready to be exchanged, there was still some wear left in them. And patrons of the theater arts would actually donate these clothes to the theater and it often became a source of costumes for the actors on stage. So in places like the Globe Theater for William Shakespeare, aristocratic families would have been one source for where they got the outfits that the actors wore on stage to portray noble characters. But what was the harsh laundering process? If they couldn't withstand this process, was it more complicated than it is today? Oh, by far. This was prior to the invention of a washing machine, so they didn't have a way to put it in a machine, but that doesn't mean they didn't use tools. There were several different ways that you could clean your clothes. Here's just a few of them. The first example is river washing. Now you've seen this in pictures, but it's just what it sounds like. You take your clothes down to the river and you wash it in the water by the river. You might have a bar of soap that you rub on the clothes and then you rub the clothes against itself to get the dirt out and then you rinse it in the river. You might also use a rock or something rough to rub out particularly dirty spots in the clothes. This was a way of washing laundry that persisted even into the 19th century and in more rural areas of the country where it, the progress of society was slower to reach, it lasted even longer than that. And this would happen at all levels of society, although it was common to take with you something like a washing bat, which looks a lot like a cricket paddle, and you just beat the clothes with it as a way to get the dirt out. Famously, Lady Macbeth cries out, 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 to the spot that she's removing after the murder of King Duncan in Shakespeare's Macbeth. That line carries a certain weight when you understand that as a woman, Lady Macbeth was likely skilled at getting spots out of clothing. So when she's scrubbing and screaming at the spot she can't remove, there's a real sense of personal frustration for her that obviously has a bigger indication, but it's tied into the fact that it was women who were doing the laundry. While Lady Macbeth's spot was all in her head, for physical stains, there were several different methods for scrubbing out the stains and bleaching the clothes. Here's just a few of them. The first is really disgusting, but they used human urine. There was a theory that a man's urine was better than a woman's urine. There's a biological reason for that in terms of hormones and composition and level of ammonia in your urine, but regardless of whose urine you used, you would take it and use the urine and the ammonia in the urine to bleach the clothes. There is a manual from Hannah Woolley in The Complete Servant Maid from 1677 that says, before that you suffer it to be washed, lay it all night in urine. The next day, rub all the spots in the urine as if you were washing in water, then lay it in more urine another night, and then rub it again. 
and so do until you find they be quite out. So urine was collected and used for the washing. Now, where did they get the urine? Well, if you remember, indoor toilets, while they did exist in Shakespeare's lifetime, and that is a subject for another episode here on Did Shakespeare, they did have chamber pots as more common ways of going to the bathroom indoors. And so they would gather up all the urine from the chamber pots and use it to wash the laundry. The ammonia in the urine would remove grease and oils and stains before it was then soaked in a washing tub. There was a giant tub that you put the washing in. This was called a buck tub. And after that, a buck cloth would be spread over the top. And then something like potash or lye would be run through it to clean out anything else. If you'll know anything about lye, it's extremely caustic. Nothing is going to live once you have covered it in lye. It was even dangerous to the people washing it. And sometimes the clothes were layered and hung out on sticks and the lye poured through it while it was hanging there. Some people think that this process was where we get the term passing the buck. There was a series of soaking the laundry, stirring it with a paddle, getting it out, hanging it on a line, slapping it with a stick to get stuff out, and then putting it back into the wash to go through this process again. Some historians write that this process could be repeated in a cycle as many as eight times to get the laundry completely clean. Another very common way of bleaching your clothes that we still use today is the sunshine. Some people would hang it on clothes lines, but more commonly, they would just lay it out on the ground. In fact, in towns or at aristocratic houses, they would have entire lawns specifically for the purpose of laying out their laundry to dry. It was called a bleaching ground, and it was just a large area of mown grass where household linens and clothing could be spread during daylight hours to dry and to bleach in the sun. This concept came over to America from England and the early American settlers would actually have communal bleaching grounds in their towns and villages. Both washing and drying were seen as public events. In fact, usually once a year, there was what's called the Great Wash, which is where an entire household would clean everything from the top to bottom. This, uh, this process could take several days. It involved sometimes bringing in specialty workers who were specifically trained in being good laundresses. And the Great Wash was often seen as the annual purification of the house and is a precursor to what we think of today as spring cleaning. According to a blog called Old and Interesting, which is indeed old and interesting, the Duke of Bedford's Great Wash in 1675 has an itemized list of what it took for that household in that year to perform their Great Wash. Here's a few of the things that were included on his list. For washing sheets and napkins before the Great Wash when the two master was in town, two shillings four pounds of soap, six pounds of candles, three women, one day to wash, a woman, two days to help dry up the lemon, linen, linen, oil, ashes, and sand to scour, a woman to scour for two days, washing of 12 pairs of sheets at four denarius a pair. I'm not completely sure about the cost here. Figuring out Elizabethan coinage is another episode of Did Shakespeare, so I'm not going to tell you today what this translates to in today's money, but you can go check out Elizabethan coinage to figure that out later. But as you can see, there were mops and soap and sand, and I'm counting at least seven, eight, nine, nine women who were hired specifically to come in and help complete this washing process. And it was just several days of constant cleaning, and he would have had one of these great lawns to lay it all out on. And there are several paintings that show exactly what this looks like. And you'll have pots with people, and then out on the lawn, you'll see the cleaned, ready to dry linens laid out all over the grass. So that's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash. I hope you learned something new about the Bard. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to practice Shakespeare's history for yourself, consider becoming a member of Experience Shakespeare. Experience Shakespeare is the membership arm. It supports the podcast and the Shakespeare episodes that we do here, but mostly it's a community of people who love Shakespeare's history and want to try it out for themselves. Experience Shakespeare is $20 a month and you get a digital history activity kit sent to you every month. 
These digital history activity kits are recipes, games, and dances that you can do at home to practice a piece of Shakespeare's history for yourself. We have things like how to play Elizabethan card games, how to make Shrewsbury cakes, how to make marmalade. All of these things are packed inside these digital history kits and sent to you with everything you need to know to do this at home for yourself. So if you really want to dive in and explore Shakespeare's history in a hands-on way, check out CassidyCast.com slash experience. And of course, if you have any questions or want to find out more, please email me. I would love to talk with you about it and help you get started. That's it for this week. Thank you for being here. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learned something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.